Welcome to our orthopedics webinar series. My name is Sarah Hibner, and on behalf of Premier Health and Premier Health's orthopedic specialists, I'd like to thank each of you for attending this evening. We are so glad to have you with us. Tonight, we are here to discuss joint pain. As you may know, joint pain is a common issue for many. You are not alone. The good news is that there are options available to help reduce your pain, increase mobility, and get you back to the activities you love. Our physician expert, Dr. Louis Okafor, will give a brief presentation this evening on those options. He will also answer some of your questions following his presentation. To submit a question, click the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen and type in your question. You may send in your questions at any time during the presentation. There may also be a chat button on your screen, but please disregard that and send your questions by clicking the Q&A button. We will try to get to as many of them as possible tonight. Also, the seminar will be recorded, so you will receive a link to the recording via email in the next few days, likely early late this week, should you want to go back and reference any portion of this evening's presentation. Thank you, Dr. Okafor, for being with us this evening, and I will turn the presentation over to you. Thank you very much, Sarah. All right, welcome everybody. My name is Dr. Lewis Okafor. I'm one of the orthopedic surgeons at Premier Orthopedics. I specialize in hip and knee reconstruction and advanced hip and knee techniques uh, for the treatment of degenerative uh, joint diseases. Uh, my training, I trained uh, for undergrad at Johns Hopkins University. Uh, my secondary location was then for medical school at the University of Rochester, then completed my residency training at Johns Hopkins, as well as my fellowship training at WashU in St. Louis. Uh, before joining the team at Premier Orthopedics. And over the last two years, it's been a pleasure serving the Dayton community. So let's jump right into this talk. Our discussion topics for today are the common causes of joint pain, getting a proper diagnosis, and then our treatment options, including non-surgical treatment options, when is surgery right for you, and then going into our surgical options. And then we'll wrap up with a little Q&A. So let's take a look about a little bit about knee cartilage and what normal knee looks like. Uh, so this first image on the left-hand side shows uh, the different types of cartilage in the knee. There's two types of cartilage. One is your articular cartilage, and the other one is made up of the meniscus, which is a discoid uh, portion of the knee that allows you to dissipate force in the knee. And of course, this makes up our normal joint space. So if we look at an x-ray here on the right hand of your screen, we can see what a normal joint space looks like, where our x-rays only show us the bones, but then the implied space is our cartilage. So as our joints gain life experience, we get an accumulation of injuries and wear and tear, which leads to inflammation and further joint deterioration. And this cartilage loss actually leads to, leads to an ability or a loss in the ability to absorb water molecules inside your cartilage, and then you get less cushioning. And then our supportive structures like our meniscus lose their elastic ability, and then they break down and cause a little bit more tearing. So our common causes of acute joint pain uh, include ligament sprains, muscle strains or tears, fractures, dislocations, as well as meniscal and cartilage tears. They include tendonitis and bursitis, as well as inflammatory conditions like gout and autoimmune conditions uh, like rheumatoid flares. The key point about this is it, it's acute joint pain, which is joint pain that uh, happens in a time period of less than three months. Where we differentiate that is when we talk about chronic joint pain, which is joint pain that lasts more than three months. And this includes arthritis uh, with a subcategory of osteoarthritis, rheumatoid arthritis, or post-traumatic arthritis, which happens to happen after an acute flare-up or a traumatic injury. We also want to discuss a little bit about degenerative meniscal tears, as well as chronic instability due to old or poorly healed ligament injuries. When we discuss osteoarthritis, uh, the key factor in the root word osteoarthritis, osteo meaning of the bone, arth meaning of the joint, and itis meaning of inflammation, it leads, us to discuss, it leads us to discuss that this is a degenerative joint disease and it's the most common type of arthritis affecting over 27 million Americans. It is a frequent cause of chron chronic joint pain and it most commonly affects the knees, the hips, the hands, and the spine, usually weight-bearing joints. And this represents a loss of the normal articular cartilage. And this develops over time, known as a progressive type of condition or disease. There's currently no cure, but we do have available treatments that focus on relieving the symptoms and improving your function. 
So the common types of symptoms associated with arthritis include uh, an increase in your pain, a decrease in your mobility, a decrease in your strength around your joint, as well as a decrease in your proprioception and balance. And proprioception meaning uh, the sense of position of your joint in a, in a given space. And patients often utilize strategies to decrease movement of that joint to help alleviate uh, pressure and pain. Looking at this next slide is joint changes that happen with age and over time. Uh, so on the left hand side of your screen is a little schematic that shows uh, areas of exposed bone underneath cartilage, erosions in that cartilage, bone spur formation, which is also known as osteophytes, and then meniscal erosions, which happen and decrease your joint space. So if I show you this image here on the right hand side of your screen, uh, depicting an arthritic x-ray, it definitely shows kind of these findings with this joint space narrowing, this increased density of the bone, which we call sclerosis, as well as osteophyte formation or bone spurs, spurs forming. Similar things happen in the hip. Um, when we think about our hip joint, it's usually the articulation between the proximal part of your femur and then the socket of your pelvis, which makes your actual hip joint. And the same findings can be found with bone spurs and cartil cartilage changes. And this is just a x-ray depicting that, where here on the right-hand side of your screen depicting the left hip shows a more normal looking joint with a smooth joint surface. And on the uh, left on the right hip on the left hand side of your screen also showing the same thing um, with erosion of your joint space a large bone cyst here um, and advanced changes in arthritic osteoarthritic changes so treatment of arthritis to, takes a whole team to treat uh, it's a multidisciplinary care team which includes uh, participation between your primary care physician your family doctor as well as your sports medicine physician your orthopedic surgeon your rheumatologist your physical therapist, uh, your occupational therapist, as well as a clinical dietitian or a nutritionist. And it's typically important to see your doctor sooner than later. And the, the signs that lead you to that are evidence of persistent swelling, intermittent locking or painful clicking with activity, pain that's not relieved with rest, over-the-counter medications or activity modifications, and pain that persistently prevents you from doing your normal daily activities. When we think about treatment, we like to start off with non-operative treatment. And our goal is for sure to delay major surgery. And we think about this with our younger patients or patients who have med multiple medical problems that surgery may not be indicated for. Our ultimate goal is to decrease your pain and ultimately to improve your function. As far as major lifestyle modifications, these include weight loss. Uh, as uh, you may know that increased weight causes increased stress in your joints. And for every step you take, you put about seven times your body weight through your knees and about four times your body weight through your hip. And these health benefits actually extend beyond the relief of osteoarthritis pain uh, and disease progression. Another big factor that we consider is your body mass index, which is your mass in kilograms divided by your height uh, in meters squared. And it's not necessarily the same thing as your bo body fat percentage, but the actual mass that you carry. And our goal for our BMI is between 20 and 30. And another point about that is uh, if, if you calculate your BMI and your BMI is over the, the uh, number of 40, that puts you in a category of uh, morbid obesity, which is something that we fear and increases uh, risk of complications and issues with surgery down the line. Major things to consider are lifestyle modifications, especially with your diet and your nutrition. So a well-balanced diet is super important and you want variety and definitely moderation. Uh, a diet that's low in fat, low in cholesterol, and low in sugar is definitely recommended, as well as inflammation fighting foods, including flaxseed oil, omega-3 acids, olive oil, whole grains and fiber, and of course, fruits and vegetables, and as well, alcohol in moderation. Smoking is a big no-no, an absolute no-no. So the, the idea with smoking is that uh, increased smoking uh, would put you at high risk for complications after hip replacement surgery or any joint sparing procedures, uh, let alone uh, increase your risk of uh, cardiovascular disease. The next portion we'll talk about is thermotherapy, uh, the difference between hot and cold therapy. With cold, uh, the effects are reducing swelling and inflammation around your joints, helps to block your nerve impulses around your joints as well as reduce muscle spasms. And it's most effective during an acute flare-up uh, of pain. 
and ice wrapped around the a towel uh, for about 20 minutes at a time is recommended. In regards to heat, uh, there's less evidence for heat, but the idea is that it reduces pain and stiffness around your joint, increases blood flow, and may, in a short period of time, increase inflammation and edema, but that resolves shortly. Uh, moist towels or heat packs wrapped in a towel for 15 to 20 minutes is recommended. As far as medications go, um, acetaminophen or Tylenol uh, is pretty helpful. Uh, there's a new stronger uh, formulation of this, Tylenol arthritis, that may have significant effect on pain relief. And the recommendation is uh, to utilize this at less than three to four grams daily. Anti-inflammatories such as ibuprofen, aspirin, naproxen, diclofenac, indomethacin, and many more uh, can be very helpful in reducing inflammation. And there's not one that's necessarily superior than the other. Um, it's just trying out uh, different ones to see which one uh, has an affinity for you. And this may be more effective to, IB, uh, to Tylenol, uh, given that it's a direct anti-inflammatory with a risk profile um, of GI upset potentially and uh, kidney complications if overused. Some nutritional supplements can be helpful, for example, glucosamine and chondroitin sulfate. Um, they do have some natural anti-inflammatory help and actions, and it may help slow progression of disease, but it's not quite predictable. And typically, you have to use these for up to two months uh, to see any kind of benefit. Exercise and activity modifications um, are also one modality to help uh, with decreasing weight. It helps reduce pain and improve your function uh, around your joints. Of course, facilitates your weight control, increases your energy. And then there's some psychological and social benefits to exercising. Uh, you do get some benefit with muscle strengthening and applying less pressure across your joints. And then the other benefit is less stiffness and more flexibility. And there are some tailored exercises or exercise modifications that can help uh, due to limitations with arthritis and pain. Some other guidelines include aerobic activity, uh, not too aggressive, just light to moderate intensity, which includes walking, cycling, or aquatic therapy. Low impact exercises, so avoiding running or jumping type exercises. And then supervised exercise classes have showed to have the largest gains in weight loss. Um, range of motion and flexibility exercises are also helpful in improving joint motion and decreasing your stiffness. And consistency really is the key with this, with improvement sh uh, shown with six months of consistent exercise. Physical and occupational therapy are also important adjuncts, which help you uh, reach a goal of getting back to normal range of motion, reducing your pain and stiffness around your joint and building strength. And these can be very therapeutic exercises, uh, can help with uh, educating you along with activities to avoid and, and try out that decrease joint pain and stiffness, as well as the use of walking aids and manual therapies, which include massage or ch chiropractic care. Here's a, just a list of a few exercises that might be ideal and helpful for hip and knee pain. One is a, a straight leg raise, and there's three different variations shown depicted here. Sit to stands, and there's different modifications that can be applied, as well as stretches, which include stretches for your hip flexors and quads, hamstrings and calves, all muscles that uh, help support the joints. Another modality uh, that can be helpful for joint pain include cortisone injections. These are a direct anti-inflammatory uh, directly into the affected joint, whether it's your hip or your knee, and it's symptomatic treatment. Uh, it does not alter your disease progression. Another note about cortisone injections, these can be given as often as every two to three months, uh, depending on uh, the physician applying it um, and depending on your symptoms. The other type of injection include gel injections or gel shots. Uh, these are uh, helpful adjuncts, uh, which are made out of the same material that's found inside your joint, uh, which is hyaluronic acid. And they have good yet inconclusive evidence for how effective they might be. Um, these act mainly as a lubricant for the joint. So what's next if your joint still hurts? And what are your options going forward? So is surgery right for you? These are some of the questions that you should be asking your orthopedic surgeon. One, when will I know when it's the right time to have surgery? 
Two, what are the expected benefits of surgery and for how long? Three, what are my limitations after surgery? And four, can I expect a return to normal activity? Five, will I need physical therapy? Six, what is the typical duration of recovery? And seven, will I need assistance at home and for how long? And these questions will be, will be answered and addressed at the end of our webinar. So as far as surgical options are, con are concerned, uh, there is arthroscopy, which is more of a minimally invasive type of procedure, and then joint replacement, including partial and total joint replacement. For arthroscopy, uh, some ways that it's been described are cleanup of the joint or scraping out the arthritis. This involves a small pencil-sized instrument inserted through small inc incisions into the knee or the hip to help completely visualize the inside of the joint and then treat any underlying soft tissue or cartilage uh, defects or conditions. The good part about arthroscopy is that it's minimally invasive. It can be done as an outpatient. There's lo a low complication burden or low risk, and there's a quick recovery. The unfortunate side of it is that there's limited indications. It's not a good treatment for arthritis, and it's better for cartilage or meniscal type injuries. So it's best when the pain uh, is occurring for less than one year, and there's mechanical complaints like new onset locking, catching, popping of the joint, or giving way of the joint. And a must is that you have to have maintained joint uh, spaces on your x-rays, meaning that you don't have advanced arthritis. So when should you consider a joint replacement? Well, it's when the pain is affecting your quality of life and you're no longer able to do the activities that you like to do, uh, when conservative treatment has failed, or when the expected results are worth the risks of surgery. As far as knee replacement, about 750,000 knee replacements are performed in the United States. Uh, and this is a combination between total knee replacement and partial knee replacement, also called unicompartmental knee replacement. This is uh, an image of a knee where only one part of the knee, the medial compartment here is affected. And this would be a patient who would be a great candidate for partial knee replacement. And this is what that looks like here on this next slide, where that joint space is now opened up with this partial knee replacement. As far as total knee replacement, uh, this image shows, especially in this right knee here, arthritis affecting multiple parts of the joint here on the medial compartment, here in the posterior compartment, and here underneath the uh, kneecap in the patellofemoral compartment. So this would be a patient who would be a great candidate for a total knee replacement. And this is a schematic of that right knee with a total knee replacement in place. And so the question might be, what is actually replaced in the, in the knee itself? And it's really this distal portion of the distal femur and this proximal portion of the proximal tibia that's resurfaced and replaced with this metal implant. And the inner piece here is a polyethylene bearing surface. As far as hip replacement, approximately 400,000 hip replacements are performed in the United States. And that involves resurfacing the socket of the pelvis, the acetabulum, and placing this metal acetabular shell inside with would seat an acetabular liner, it's, which is made of plastic. And then the head ball, which is made of either metal or ceramic, as well as a stem that sits right into the femur. And this is just a schematic of what a total hip replacement looks like once performed. Now, over the last several years, there's been an increased popularity in robotic assisted total hip and knee replacement surgery and premieres proud to offer that to our patients um, with a new hip application coming out uh, this summer. In review, joints give us our freedom to move and perform our daily tasks. They keep our joints healthy and flexible by managing weight, staying active and treating injuries when they occur. <clears throat> Work with your surgeon and physical therapist to determine the cause and best treatment for your joint pain. And there are many options, both non-surgical and surgical, to help you improve your uh, symptoms and quality of life. And I'm going to open the floor up for any questions. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Okafor. As a reminder, if you would like to ask a question, please type it into the Q&A, which you can find by hovering your cursor over the bottom of your Zoom window. So the first question we have is, are there any injections to minimize knee pain? 
Yes, absolutely. Yeah. So there, the injections come in two forms. Uh, one is the corticosteroid injection, uh, which we talked about briefly. Um, and that is a injection with a mixture of a, a short acting lidocaine or marcaine analog, along with a steroid that should give you some instant relief with the, um, with the marcaine, or, uh, marcaine analog, as well as some long-term relief with the steroid. And that's an anti-inflammatory. The second flavor of injection is the gel injection, which comes in also different flavors, but the whole point of the gel injection is to be a lubricant inside your joint. So it doesn't have any pain relieving properties, but it serves as a, a lubricant that allows your joint to move smoother and easier. And the idea is that if your joint moves easier, then it decreases your pain. The next question is, what is your opinion of PRP treatment? So that's a great question. Um, to date, uh, there's no true literature that supports PRP injections in either the hip or the knee. Um, there are some patients that they found it to be helpful in. It's usually patients who are somewhat younger, who have a very high level of healing potential, who don't have a high level of arthritis and might have a minor um, meniscal injury or a minor cartilage injury. Um, in terms of arthritis, um, it hasn't shown to have much benefit. Um, most of the literature has been found with uh, more of the soft tissue injuries like Achilles tendon ruptures um, and shoulder injuries and things like that, rotator cuff ruptures and things like that. What, uh, what treatment options are available for bursitis of the knee? That's a great question. So bursitis of the knee is a little less common than bursitis of the hip. Um, the treatment options um, uh, stem from anywhere from conservative treatment, which includes oral anti-inflammatories, topical treatments such as ice and heat, um, and then uh, moving on to injection therapy. Now, it depends on where the bursitis is happening. There are multiple places to get bursitis in the knee. There's bursitis directly in the front of the knee called prepartellar bursitis. There's uh, bursitis right in front of the tendon, which is similar, um, as well as bursitis right in the front uh, of your tibia bone, um, which is pes bursitis. Uh, so it just depends on, on where the source of your bursitis is coming from. Typically, we do inject those in the office, um, and we go, we go through several treatments before we decide to go in there and potentially remove the, the knee bursa if, if, if if it's causing enough problems. But usually we try to get down to the source of the bursitis before uh, we go into anything surgical. Okay, this next question is about um, the stage of your symptoms. So how does one know as in symptoms, what stage you're at in terms of treatment versus surgery? That's a, that's a great question. I, I'd say the easiest way would be to uh, potentially come into the office and confer with your physician to start off with. So if your pain has been going on for less than three months, likely you're in the acute phase or the beginning signs of arthritis. Um, if it's been going on for a lot longer, you, you've probably moved into more of a chronic stage of arthritis. But arthritis is one, a symptomatic um, diagnosis, as well as a radiographic diagnosis, which means x-rays are needed uh, to be seen to help at least figure out exactly what stage of arthritis you're in. And then from there, if it's early stage, we typically try to do conservative treatment, um, non-surgical treatment. And if you're more of the later stages, we still try to do non-surgical treatment as a first method and first line, uh, but it may turn out that we end up moving to surgery um, as a definitive measure for treatment. Okay, next question. Does collagen, uh, do collagen supplements help with joint pain? And can they help in healing from a total knee replacement? To date, there are no studies that show that they help with healing with joint replacement. Um, collagen is a naturally occurring substance in the body. And I think supplementing it um, can be helpful. Um, it can help with you know, anything that requires protein as a building block. Uh, so it helps boost your immune system. It helps heal minor injuries of the, of the limbs, the bones, the joints. Um, as far as aiding with arthritis pain and, and alleviating that, um, since arthritis is a progressive inflammatory condition, it's not indicated, um, but I think that collagen overall as a substance uh, can't harm you. It, it's, it's helpful if anything. Okay, the next question is about hip replacement. Um, so what is the hip replacement recovery time 
how long before I can walk without a cane or walker? And then is hip replacement in outpatient surgery? Those are great questions. Um, so recovery for hip, from hip replacement depends on whether or not, you, uh, it depends on the approach you had for your hip replacement, whether you had your approach from the anterior approach versus the posterior approach. But I would say no matter the approach, most patients recover significantly by three months postoperatively. Um, so you can expect that for the first week or two after surgery, you're using a cane to ambulate, to walk around, and then you're transitioning to a, um, excuse me, you, for the first two or three weeks after surgery, you're using a walker, then transitioning to a cane afterwards. And then I'd say about week four, between anywhere between week four to six, you won't need any assistive walking aids. Um, so that's about when uh, most people recover. And uh, Sarah, you have to give me the other two questions that were asked so I can make sure I address those. One was recovery. Sure. Sorry. Um, yes. So how long before I can walk without a cane or walker? So that's, yeah, that's about four to, that's roughly about four to six weeks after surgery. And then there's one other part of that question. And then is hip replacement and outpatient surgery? Yes. So it can be done as an outpatient, um, depends on the facility that you're at, if they have those services available. Um, but out, outpatient hip replacement is certainly a, a possibility. Um, there are patients of mine, um, I'd probably say about 30% of my practice goes home the same day, and the other 70% stay in the hospital on average one night overnight. Um, but it is becoming more and more feasible and possible to do hip replacements as an outpatient, yes. Okay, the next question, um, is robotic surgery easier to recover from than regular total knee replacement? I would say the recovery time is similar. Um, there are reports that state uh, based on the precision with robotic surgery that recovery can be quicker. Um, it, it just really depends on the hands of the treating surgeon. Um, the, the, the thing to remember is that a robot is a tool and it's an it's a, a, a additional accessory in a, in a surgeon's toolbox. And so um, at the end of the day, the surgeon still has to do the procedure. And so I would, I would say, you know, it'd be something to discuss with your surgeon on their average patient recovery times. But on average, it has been noted that uh, based on the precision that the implants are placed, that patients can recover quicker with a robot. Yes. Okay, um, so the person who submitted the question, what would be a first step? If you could please um, maybe add a little bit more to your question in the, in the Q&A, and then we'll um, make sure that gets asked. Um, next question, are the, and I apologize if I mispronounce this, um, the cruciate ligaments removed with a knee replacement? And if so, how is stability retained? That's a, that's a really great question. Um, there are two main styles of knee replacement surgery, and it just depends on, on what's best in a surgeon's hands. Um, for me particularly, uh, the type of knee replacement that I employ is called a cruciate retaining knee replacement, which means that I retain uh, your posterior cruciate ligament, your PCL, and I do take out the ACL. Now, the other style is a PS knee, a uh, cruciate uh, sorry, a PS knee is a posterior stabilized knee, which does not retain your cruciate ligaments. And both the ACL and PCL are removed as part of the procedure. These are standard ways to do knee replacements. Those are the two most popular way to do knee replacements. Um, as far as stability, uh, the stability is maintained by the actual congruency of the implants that are put in. So precise cuts and then the actual uh, congruency between um, the two metal components and the polyethylene liner. And that's the same for both a cruciate retaining knee and a cruciate sacrificing or poster stabilized knee. Um, yeah, that, that, that's basically the gist of it. But, but the stability is maintained through the uh, additional ligaments in the, in the knee, including the lateral collateral ligament and the medial collateral ligament. Okay, we have another knee question. Should you have both knees replaced at the same time? That's a great question. Uh, it, it, it leads up to questions on uh, surgeon comfort and operative time. Uh, my preference is to do one knee at a time. That way you're only having to recover from one knee at a time and not both knees, uh, given that it, it is quite difficult to rehab you know, both knees. 
There are rare exceptions where a patient's health may not dictate them to undergo surgery more than once uh, or, or other conditions where they might have a deformity on one side that may preclude them from uh, recovering appropriately by doing just one of the knees. And in those rare instances, doing both knees at the same time makes more sense. Uh, but most surgeons typically do one knee, wait about six weeks to three months and then do the other side. If my, if my left hip is replaced, how long will it take for me to be able to drive? That's great. Uh, so if your left hip is replaced, you can drive as soon as you're not taking narcotic pain medication. Um, and likely, as if you're comfortable, you know, getting into a low car, or if you have a high car, um, but most patients can drive probably about three to four weeks after surgery from a left hip, and maybe four to six weeks after surgery on a right hip. Okay. Next question is about arthritis. Would there be a way to just treat arthritis first? Um, and they followed up that up with not sure why medicine today does not treat full symptoms. So yes, that, that to answer that question, that goes down the avenue of our non-surgical conservative treatments, which include a multitude of things uh, to start off with. Um, oral therapy, so Tylenol, oral anti-inflammatories, ibuprofen, and the other drugs in that class. Um, topical agents and therapies, such as um, your over-the-counter aspirin creams, diclofenac or Voltaren gel, um, biofreeze, things like that. Um, and then there's physical therapies, so stretching and strengthening exercises, um, moving down to injection therapies, um, and then only then, and if and only then, those type of therapies, conservative measures fail, do we move on to more advanced things like surgery. So surgery is never our first line of treatment. Okay, next question. Do cortisone shots in the hip cause, uh, apologies, do cortisone shots in the hip joint cause the cartilage to deteriorate more quickly? Yes and no. So. Uh, it depends on the frequency and the dosage at which you're getting the cortisone injections. Uh, so, so long as you're receiving cortisone injections at a low dose, uh, spread out at three months or more intervals, then it's pretty safe on the joint. Um, any more than that with increased quantity or intervals uh, can lead to, um, we call it chondrotoxicity or toxicity to cartilage itself. And that can cause weakening of your joint or progress your arthritis symptoms. So it is a double-edged sword, um, but it's something that you sparingly can be very helpful with pain. Okay, we have just a couple questions left, but there's still plenty of time. So feel free to um, continue to add questions into the Q&A. Next question is, who is a good candidate for, for robotic joint replacement? So that's a great question. Um, most patients would be a, a great candidate. Uh, in my hands, I reserve robotic surgery mainly for patients who have a high level of deformity or, or patients who have uh, pre-existing implants uh, from fractures or, or uh, ACL repairs or something like that that I need to avoid with the total knee implants. Um, but it just depends on the surgeon. Um, but I would say most patients are, would be an outright candidate for robotic uh, replacement. And I'd say that the only patients who may not be um, a candidate uh, could potentially be um, patients who are morbidly obese or uh, patients who otherwise would not be a good candidate for a knee replacement in general. Okay, next question is, why do knees pop? That's a great, great question. Uh, it depends. There are many things in the knee that can cause popping. Uh, for instance, um, mild movement between your uh, ACL and your uh, PCL can cause popping in the joint. But the most common thing that causes popping in the joint is likely um, a symptomatic pop with a painful pop, which is a tear in your meniscus, and then an asymptomatic pop, which is what we call plica inside the knee joint. Uh, it's a cartilaginous structure that everyone has, usually not painful, but can cause popping in the knee joint. And those are the two reasons why people get popping.
Okay, next question is, how long will a knee or hip replacement last? That's a great question. Um, so right now, uh, with conventional highly cross-linked polyethylene, which is our what some of our newest bearing surfaces, knee replacements are lasting upwards of 20 to 25 years. Uh, and when they're checking the data and checking patients, we're seeing that there's minimal wear and tear. Uh, hip, hip replacements are along the same lines, 20 to 25 years or even more. And we're seeing very minimal uh, wear rates, very minimal revision rates with the new, with the new bearing surfaces. Okay, unless, oh, there is one more question. Um, what is treatment for knee pop? Um, it, and this person says it just started and I'm very athletic um, and it's annoying and actually hurts. So if you have painful knee popping, um, the initial treatment would be to modify your activities depending on what activity is causing the popping. If it's running versus uh, weightlifting versus um, any high intensity type workouts would be to, to potentially uh, decrease the times that you're doing that activity, see if that improves. The next best thing would be to see your orthopedic surgeon, see your orthopedic doctor uh, for an evaluation to see if you might have um, an, a meniscal type injury or something like that. Oftentimes, uh, these type of injuries uh, wax and wane. They get, they get better for a time, and then they come back. Um, the definitive test would be to get an MRI of your knee, find out if you have a potential meniscal tear or something else that's causing that popping, and then you know, go through potential treatment regimens for that. Okay, we do have a couple more questions. Um, I'm considering a hip replacement in the future. Do you recommend trying glucosamine and, um, I'm sorry, um, chondroitin? Thank you. So I, the one study that talks about this shows that about 30% of the population have some benefit and respond to glucosamine and chondroitin. Otherwise, it's it's basically placebo for the other 66% of the population. It, it's, it's, a, you know, it's a relatively inexpensive product to try um, that could potentially help with your joints and help your joints feel better. It might have some anti-inflammatory properties, but it doesn't reverse arthritis. Um, arthritis, unfortunately, still progresses. Um, and so um, it, in, in younger patients, it may help protect your joints, um, make your joints feel better down the line. In our older patients who have arthritis, it may slow down the progression of arthritis, but it can't reverse arthritis. And so if you have end-stage arthritis that's symptomatic and that um, unfortunately has failed non-surgical or conservative treatment, then hip replacement is likely your next step and your best answer uh, for long-term relief. Okay, next question. Um, what about stem cell injections? So stem cell injections are, are really along the same lines of uh, PRP, um, just under under just a different kind of name. Um, and the literature does not support that for the knee or the hip, um, noting that you know the most the most evidence is found in soft tissue type injuries or or joints with uh, very minor wear and tear. With joints with a advanced arthritis, they have there has been a study that shows that stem cells have been helpful. Um, so unfortunately, it's an expensive treatment with, with not, uh, not, not enough upside or not enough improvement in symptoms to, to, to warrant using. Okay, when it sounds like your bones are scraping together, is that actually what it is or is it something else? It, it could very well be depending on how bad your arthritis is. And the only way to know for sure would be to get an x-ray just to get a view of your joint and, and get an idea of what, what that actual scraping is. Um, but the likelihood uh, is, is that it is arthritis. And there are some patients who have joints that have gone, uh, gone so bad and have deteriorated so bad that you, you can actually hear uh, the sound of it scraping, or at least feel it. Next question is, what is the treatment for hip bursitis? So the treatment of hip bursitis starts usually with oral therapies, anti-inflammatories, um, physical therapies as a, a definite benefit. Um, and then the next step would be injection therapy. 
Um, hip bursitis has a number of causes, uh, one being the actual hip bursa being inflamed. Um, but the other uh, major causes could be tendinitis, where the tendons attach to the femur bone off the hip um, or off the pelvis, um, or small micro tears in some of the muscles uh, around uh, the lateral part of the femur uh, or the hip. Um, so it depends on the cause of the bursitis, but the typical treatment is usually oral anti-inflammatories, physical therapy, and potentially ejection therapy. Okay, another hip bursitis question. What causes bursitis on the outside of the hip area? So, so that, so that is exactly, you know, the, the answer I gave before, but, but, but same thing, likely due to um, either the actual bursa itself being inflamed for a number of causes. Some causes include falling directly onto the hip, so a traumatic cause. Um, some causes, uh, very rare, but an infectious cause, but the likely uh, cause and most common for most people are either um, atrophy of the muscles due to not using them very often. Our hip muscles are some of the, no matter how much we walk, they're some of the most underused and underworked muscles in our body. So some of it is used, uh, caused by disuse atrophy. And then a large number of these are usually caused by tendonitis or micro tears on the, on the outside of the hip. Okay, um, this is the last question in the chat, but again, feel free to continue to add questions if you'd like. Um, what is the normal amount of physical therapy needed after a hip replacement? Oh, well, that's a great question. So that, that's really gonna vary uh, from patient to patient, depending on your pre-existing function before hip replacement surgery. On average, most patients uh, require anywhere from four weeks after uh, surgery of therapy, uh, all the way up to up to three months after surgery. And it just depends on what the patient's goals are, what activity level they'd like to return to. Uh, the majority of patients can get uh, to walking without an assistive aid uh, between weeks four and six after surgery. Okay, one additional bursitis question. If none of the treatment for bursitis is working, is a hip replacement indicated? No, so that, that's actually a very wonderful question. Um, so no, uh, so usually after, if the treatments for bursitis are not working, the next step would be to get an advanced image, uh, potentially an MRI, and then get down to the root cause of the bursitis. Um, if that root cause is due to just inflammation around the bursa, and that patient has not been able to receive adequate pain relief after injection, then removing the bursa is the next step, so a bursectomy. Um, if the MRI shows that you have tears, um, essentially complete tears of your gluteus tendons that attach to the side of the femur, which is essentially the hip or the hip bursa, um, then that would require repairing those tendons surgically. Um, and so it just depends on what the source of the, the bursitis and the pain is coming from. Okay, I think that was our last question. So thank you everyone. Um, and thank you Dr. Okafor for your informative presentation. We appreciate your time and expertise. And I want to thank you so much for joining us this evening and hope that you have found the information shared useful. We feel privileged to be with you tonight and hope that you will consider us for any healthcare needs you may have. If you'd like to learn more about Dr. Okafor or his practice, Premier Orthopedics, you can visit premierorthooh.com. More information about Dr. Okafor can also be found on his bio that was sent along with the information to access tonight's event. Should you have additional questions or would like to make an appointment, his office phone number is on both the practice website and on his bio. Last but not least, as a reminder, this seminar was recorded and we will email you a link to the recording should you want to go back and listen to some or all of this great content again. As soon as it's available, we will share the URL to access the recording. Along with that recording URL, we will share a link to a short survey on tonight's program. We value your feedback and would appreciate if you would take a few minutes to share your thoughts with us. And with that, we wish you all a good evening and thanks again.